Well, uh, wasn't expecting to be here, but I'm glad it's this Sunday as opposed to last Sunday. Uh, it, as most of you know, if you don't know, Josh and Katie and Reagan and their family had a little scare last Friday, I believe it was. Well, really, they've been battling it a while, but it got really scary last week. Uh, ended up having to go to Children's. Uh, he's, everything's doing better. He's home. They're, you know, if anybody needs prayer, it's Josh. He told me this morning, I heard him telling uh, Alyssa that uh, uh, trying to figure out math and how to figure out how to feed Reagan and make sure he gets all the stuff that he needs uh, uh, can be very challenging. So, so, so be in prayer for them. And by the way, if you see some kids moving, uh, we got some children's church going on. And so we got a lot of kids going. Uh, thankful for the volunteers that are in the nursery and in the children's church. So if that pertains to you, get after it. We're glad. I'm glad we're able to do that again. It's, it's good to be here. Uh, but I texted Josh uh, Saturday morning because they were, Josh was, Katie was up in children's with Reagan. Josh was being a dad to four other kids and said, hey man, you need me to preach? And I meant what I when I asked him, I would have done it, but it would have been, whoo. <laughs> uh, and he said, no, nah, it's locked and loaded. And then he, he said, hey, uh, if you can do this week. And so for those of you who don't mean, know me, my name's Micah. I, I don't get to preach every Sunday, but I do like to preach. And that's I say that every time I come up here because when I first started preaching, I didn't like it. It wasn't something that I enjoyed doing. Uh, the process to get ready, though, God's always fine-tuning some things and... Uh, uh, so I always I've, I've learned to, to 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 somewhat enjoy getting ready for the week. But normally, Josh, we plan ahead, and Josh is like, "Hey, can you feel? You know, we'll be sometimes a month, two months out." And when we jokingly last week kind of planned some vacations, like, "Well, we'll look at it this past week." And it's like, "Hey, so so I'm here, but it's good." Um, and uh, I, I feel like I got to say it for myself, not for God's sake. But uh, there's my sermon notes today. So if I don't complete a thought, that's why. But uh, I tried to, I was telling Kimberly, she, she laughed at me, um, and the We Center teachers laughed at me this week, so if you hang around me on the weeks that I preach, you get preached at a lot, because I have to, that's how my mind works, and I did, I wanted to put my notes down, uh, but, but I didn't, because God said no. So I've, I've got it in here, now if I can get it out, that'll be good, but if you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke uh, chapter 18, uh, Josh actually texted me, hey, what's your sermon? I said, just put in the rich young ruler. If they put it in the Bible, some of those guys, you'll do that. But I actually changed it this morning to why. This morning God woke me up, and, and you'll see why. We'll get there in a minute. But uh, um, turn in there. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. Uh, my Bible has it outlined, uh, a rich, the rich ruler. Some of y'all, how many of y'all got uh, y- rich young ruler? Anybody got that in their, their deal? Anybody not have a header in their Bible? They say those are probably more legit, right? I don't know. But here we go. A rich, a, the rich ruler, starting in verse 18, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it? for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And old Peter here said to him, We have all left what we... We we have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. And so uh, I titled that Why 
I, I'll give you some of my sermon titles. One of them was called The American uh, uh, because I think just in those t- titles, The Rich Young Ruder, we're going to break that down, but that could describe a lot of Americans. And, and uh, um, I, I, I felt like I needed to share this is I didn't really fully, uh, uh, I wasn't fully aware of how wealthy we were in America until you get outside of America. And you may be sitting in this room and by comparatively speaking standards, you may consider yourself less than or poor, whatever you want to call it. But on a global scale, we are all wealthy. And so when I first read this, it it made you kind of just better think about it a little bit because he says, you know, it's, it's easier for a camel two humpback camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy person to inherit the kingdom of God. So it made me just kind of check. Uh, and, and so, you know, that was kind of where I started. But I ended up, I ended up getting to this word, why. And uh, uh, this morning, God kind of woke me up. And uh, don't claim to be the best pastor, counselor, advisor. But I do like this, and I do kind of do that. But any good counselor, any good therapist anybody that that deals with some of that have you ever noticed they ask a lot of questions you know like for instance why are you here oh you know we have oh i want to be here to worship god is that really why you you know they kind of follow is that really why you're here you know my 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 daughter is asking questions all the time well why do you want that you know can i have a snack why do you want a snack well because i'm hungry well why are you hungry we just ate supper. Any of y'all have that fight at your house? Man, and it's not even my son yet. It's my, it's my daughter's. Uh, but uh, uh, I told him I wouldn't use them as a sermon illustration, so they, they're off the hook. But Kimberly, get ready. You're coming. Uh, but we do, and so we find out here in 18, a certain ruler, a rich young ruler, came and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus, like being a good pastor, good therapist, he didn't just answer his question. He answered his question with the question. Why do you call me good? And the reason why he asked him with this question, I mean, we can see here, he says no one is good except God. So basically what he's saying when he said that is, are you saying that I'm God? Because that would have been a powerful statement for this guy to do it, you know, uh, to to ask that question and to, to make that statement, good teacher, you know. Some scholars believe that he was, he was trying to butter up Jesus, right? Because we come to find out, uh, he, he gives him all these commandments. He kind of starts kind of halfway through the commandments. Because, you know, if you don't know, it's a good deal. The, the first part of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, deal with our relationship with God. You know, don't have any other gods. Don't bear, you know, don't, don't have idols, all that. The other five, how we, how we our view of God through other people. Right? Did you know that we can show our love for God through other people? Maybe you didn't know that. But how we treat other people. That's, in fact, that's how the church is supposed to be a lighthouse in the community because of how well we love one another, how well we correspond with one another, how well we take care of the orphans and the widows. Like That, that helps our relationship. And so this is where he starts. He says, you know the commandments. And he said, you know them. Why did he know them? Because he was a good Jewish guy. They knew their commandments. That Not only did they know them like we do, right? We know the commandments. They tried to live by them. They tried to outdo one another in commandments. I think there's 600 and something commandments and then uh, 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 that in the Old Testament, and then they ended up creating a few more because they wanted to outdo each other. And it didn't come from necessarily a one-upper, but maybe it did. But, but he knew these. So it was kind of, kind of like a checkbox. Do not commit adultery. Check. Uh, do not murder. Oh, have done that. Check. Do not steal. Check. Do not give false testimony. Check. Honor your father and mother. Check. In fact, other this is actually recounted in in two other gospels. I think it's Matthew and uh, uh, Mark. So you kind of get the full picture of this story. Uh, so he he said, I've done these since I was a kid. I've, I've done them since since I was a, like he really thought he had really checked all the boxes because you know we check the boxes. But sometimes we, we let you get away with just checking the box. We don't really hold you to the fire when you're, you know, coming to, you know, did you come to the church today? Check. Did you come to worship today? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. That's something between you and God. How, how, how did you approach, you know, the creator of all things today? Did you give him the worship that he deserves today? I don't know. But we, we can check that box, right? 
So he checked all these boxes. He said, all these I have kept since I was a boy. So when Jesus uh, heard this, he said to him, okay. You still lack one thing. So now I'm really diving in. If I have if I've check, 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 and there's just this one thing, like you're close. I don't ever feel like I'm that close, right? There's always something else, but, but, but you're close. And so I can, you can almost see him like leaning into this. Okay, yeah, yeah. He says, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. And so, uh, so you know, some people think this deal is about money. And obviously for this guy it is. And maybe for you it is. You know, if you came in here and you happened to get online before or you saw uh, uh, where my passage was and you kind of already knew the story, you're like, oh, great. Uh, it's not Josh this time. It's Micah hitting us up on money. It's not about that. But if you're already finding yourself, maybe this is about money for you. And, uh, um, but he tells him, you got one thing. You got one thing. And so uh, you give you a little backstory of how I got to here today because, you know, Josh preached a message on finding peace last week. And there's been times that I've kind of preached a certain part of the sermon series, which for me the hardest part is finding my scripture for me it's like once i get it i, I dive into it so i was like hey how, how, you may kind of carry on that that because this was unexpected you may carry on that 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 piece he's like well mike i'm gonna be really honest with you he said i had it pegged out over two or three four weeks long he said i kind of let everything out of the bag sunday so he said man blank canvas i was like okay so i began to pray uh uh if any of you've had a conversation with me over the last three or four months, small groups, Sunday school, life groups, whatever you want to call them, we try to rename them, has really been hard pressed on my heart. Like it is just, it just oozes out of me because uh, I've been, I'm trying to think, 2000, starting in January, I, this will be, I'll be finishing up my ninth year this year. I think this will be my tenth year. Maybe backwards. You know how it gets once you get, but, uh, you know, COVID happened and we kind of, it's good to see people in the room again, but we kind of had this weird thing called COVID, and people people didn't come to church. We shut the church down in the building. We still had the digital service, and and uh, I don't know about you, but for me, it allowed me to really just analyze my life, and I think that's why one of the re the good that God is bringing has brought through COVID. We're not longer, you know, we're trying to get back to cruise control, but we weren't on cruise control. I mean, our world was turned upside down. And some of you have having conversations with me, because uh, I never preach at you, I always preach to me, is when I didn't have the busyness of life in my life, things started that I was suppressing with the business of life started coming up. It's kind of a misliving. I talked about it this week. It was a refining Right, God was bringing these things up, and we could either deal with it or we found ways to suppress it. And uh, so I had to deal with some stuff. You know, I, I, I shared a couple of weeks ago in closing, like that was the first time I'd ever battled depression during during COVID, during the quarantine. And so, but one of the things that allowed us to do uh, as as staff members and as people that think about the church a lot is to analyze who we are as a church, right? And so analyze our, dis our disciple-making process. And so I'm getting there. Just bear with me. And so I've been looking at this summer, what is a disciple? How do we, how do we you know, if Sunday school is our disciple-making process, how are we doing? If, if small groups, if life groups is our disciple-making process, how are we doing? So, you know, we began to talk through that and do some different things and try some different things and realizing that, you know, we live in a fallen world, nothing's perfect, but we have an opportunity, we had a huge opportunity, still have a huge opportunity to kind of change some things that, that, that we felt like we needed to change. And so for me, uh, the disciple-making process, the best definition I found is these three things. And uh, Josh is really going to like it because it's got some alliteration. But a disciple does this, right? First they find... Then they follow, and then you begin to be formed, and then ultimately formed completely by it, 
right? So you find it, you follow it, and then you begin to be formed by it. And so this guy, Jesus gave him an opportunity to come and follow him. He found Jesus, right? He came to him, good teacher, right? Trying to butter him up, right? He was wanting Jesus to see, check, 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 look at all my self righteousness look at what I've done. I need, I need this, I need this, because he was rich, he was wealthy, right? And we don't look at it the same way, but back in those days, okay, the wealthy, if you were wealthy, if you were blessed, it was like a, you were blessed by God if you were wealthy. If you were poor, it meant that you had some sin in your life, some generational sin, and so you were thought less than of. So, so what Jesus was asking him to do wasn't just get rid of the stuff that he had, but it was almost going to a different... It, it, was, it, was, it was a harder pill to swallow. It was a bit hard enough for us to go sell everything we had, but also kind of changing social classes. And so the guy was saddened, but, but, but he had a, a commandment and a promise from God right there in front of him. And he walked away sad. But he found Jesus, and he chose not to follow him. And, you know, that's us in our life. So many times we find so many things because a disciple doesn't just, you know, we use, most of the time we use it in a, a spiritual context. But if you can use the word disciple in a lot of things, right? So again, I'm going to preach at myself, and if it, you know, sticks, it sticks with you. So there was a time in my life, and when I was in college, I played this deal called fantasy sports. And uh, how many of y'all know what fantasy sports are? Raise your hand. Okay. If you don't know what fantasy sports are, you basically get to draft real players. Like you get to put them on your team. Baseball, football, basketball, you know. And then, so they wouldn't necessarily, it wouldn't be like the Pittsburgh Steelers. You'd get the quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger from the Pittsburgh Steelers. And, and then you'd put them, and there's a computer, and it's, it's pretty amazing how they keep up with all that. And I was playing fantasy baseball a lot in college. And I was working. My wife was finishing school. I was working. I'd come home. And then they had this deal called MLB TV. Anybody know what that is? It's like a streaming service where you could click on... Uh, uh, I'm fixing to rat Jonathan out here in a minute. But uh, we were poor college kids, so we had one sign-on, right? We, we all funneled some money in there. We got one sign-on. And I would. I would get home at night from work. Kimberly was studying, so... You know, I would come out of the, 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 the bedroom of the computer, but I would literally come home, and it was the way that I would end my day. And it wouldn't just be for 10 minutes, checking my lineup, seeing a, it would be my whole evening. I would get in there, oh, it was baseball. So-and-so's up to bat. So I'd click on MLB TV, I'd watch the game, I'd watch him at bat. And then guess what? This guy's up to bat. Oh, now this guy's pitching. And for long, it was four or five hours. And it wasn't just that I was watching it. When I was at work, I had magazines, or I had... Uh, the internet pulled up. I was reading the injuries, and, and I found it. I began to follow it, and sooner or later, it began to form in my life, like to the tune that it wasn't that bad because my wife was studying a long, long time because she found that, she was following that. It began to form, but it was just early. But I ended up, it took me a while. She can, she can confess to that. Now, I will confess, I still do a little fantasy sports, but it not to that tune I realized that it had done some things but anything that we do that's men so women find things and follow things too and so uh, this is where Kimberly comes into the sermon illustration I warned, I prepped her so she didn't get up and walk out on me but uh, it's not bad or maybe it is for you I don't know but on Instagram what do we do Twitter who do we we, we follow people right you find them you get the search bar you find them then you begin to follow them and then it's weird, but they, they do it all the time. There's these ladies, and they'll put their phone right here in their bathroom, and they're, they're putting on this eye makeup, and they're like, oh, I got this palette at Target. You can get the same palette at Sephora, but this one does pretty much the same thing, and it's half the cost. And, but it only works if you have this special brush, right? And you, but you've got to get this brush. It's not at Sephora. It's found at Ulta. And some of y'all are amazed at my makeup <laughs> sense. But you do. And what happens is you begin, and then all of a sudden... You're in Texarkana, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to try that brush. They weren't lying. And now you believe in them, and so you follow them a little bit more. Or you build a house like we're doing. You begin to, you know, you're not, it's not a bad thing, but it just starts consuming you. And you're trying to find the perfect shiplap or the perfect tile or, or if you're like me, the, the best deal on a tile or the best deal on the, you know. And it does. So it can happen in anything. 
But the way it was supposed to happen was in the context of this. Jesus, I love reading the, recounting the stories of when the first disciples come. Right, Jesus was just baptized. John the Baptist was there. I don't remember which one it was, but it, John the Baptist was like, hey, there he is. That's the Messiah. And so they're like, hey, let's, let's go, let's go. And so they're like, Master, you know, where, where, where are you staying at? What did he say? Come and see. Who do you tell them? Come and follow me. I will make you feel, you got to come and follow. And for a lot of us, we might find him. We might come to church to find him. We might have a Facebook. We might have a Bible app that we're trying to find him. But are you following him? Because what that means is, 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 is just like this guy. He gives you a commandment. Guess what he expects? He desires for you to follow him. But he gives you free will to choose whether you do or not. Sometimes I don't like that. I wish he'd just say, love me and I would. Follow me and I would. But he doesn't. He gives us free will, which is the most beautiful thing when free will happens and you choose to find him and you choose to follow him. And then you choose to allow him to, to form you. And so, so, you know, some people take this out of context and say, it's all about money. But for this guy, it was all about money. It, it was his life. What about, what about you? you know, how, would, how would they describe your life right now? they had to put you a header. All the labels that we carry, are they accurate labels? Miss Lynette says it all the time. Somebody tells you something you don't like, you better look in the mirror. If some of it's sticking, you might need to address it because, oh, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. Well, if 17 people have said the same thing, you might need to, 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 to check yourself. But what are some things, I was thinking about, what, what are some things, you know, because money is not necessarily bad, Right? I think it's in Matthew chapter 6. You don't have to flip there, Alyssa, but it, it, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. I was telling some people this week, you know, money, it, it, it just polarizes things. So if you gave a generous person more money, what happens to them? They're probably more generous. You give a foolish person more money, what happens to them? They're probably more foolish. You know, you give uh, an addict more money, what happens? They probably increase whatever that is. You give a, 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 a rich, wealthy investor guy more money, what's he going to do? He's going to invest it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But the Bible also says, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart is too. So it's a great test of, you've heard, I hadn't said that, Josh has said it, pastors have said it before. Where you spend your money is probably your money and your time because where you're spending your money is where you're spending your time. You know? And sometimes it's good things that we spend our money on, right? Our kids, I have three of them, right? The world, America tells us you have to do these certain things to be considered a good parent. When God says, just teach them to love me and you'll be a good parent. But we get into this, we find these things, we start looking around and we start following what other people, the Joneses do, right? Uh, not Max and Stephanie Jones, but keeping up with the Joneses, right? And we begin to do it. Why? That would be, why are you doing that? It's a great question to ask yourself that we don't ask ourselves enough. Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Because see, at the root of all of this, at the root of all of this, Jesus was trying to get this one guy to give up the one thing that was competing with Jesus. And for a lot of us, it is money. Money, you know, I, I tell people all the time, when we go to Ethiopia, most of the people, I mean, I, I've shared it before, most of the people there live on 300 U.S. dollars a year. A year. To send their kids to school is $50 a year, which is, I mean, just imagine that in your, you know, if you made $50,000 a year. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money in America to, you know. And they, they trust God so much over there because they have to. We as Americans don't have to. If y'all are hungry, not, not, not very many people, when they're hungry, say, oh, God, I need you. You know, George Mueller praying for the, 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 the bread truck to come, right? We don't do that. Why? Because we're wealthy. We're rich. We're rich. What's keeping us from that? 
It's not even about, money can provide financial security, right? It can provide you with, you know, prestige, which is the end of his, right? Rich young ruler, the end of his title, the label that they put in the rich young ruler. He loved having that authority. He loved having that power, that position. Money can give you that. You need some friends? Get some more money. You need, you need some things? Get some more money. So it's, it's amazing. I, 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 don't quote me on this, uh, but I think that is the only place that God really says, this is what, can, this is what in the world really competes with me, is money in, in Matthew chapter 6. He doesn't just say the things that compete with me. He says money. But he also g- instilled in him a, 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 a commandment asking people to give that tithe. Why? Because when you give it that first, it can't hold power over you. And let me tell you, this is preaching from the choir. I am a tight-fisted dude. I am. It was a hard deal for me. For other people, it's not. But, but it was. Having that open hand, right, to freely give. And, and I love this illustration, is that money flies out of that hand really fast when it's, when it's open, right? When you're holding on to it, you can I put a dollar in that, you couldn't get it out of there, right? But if you keep that open, it flows out. But guess what else? It can flow in too. So when you freely give, when you do that, and God, God put that, God ordained that because he didn't want it to be something that he could, because having money is not a bad thing, I promise you. It's, a way, it's one of the ways, one of the many ways that God blesses you, right? To t- he promises you to, in fact, he tells us that we should be content if we have a place to stay and food in our belly, not if we have cars and side-by-sides and all those things. But those things aren't bad unless they're bad, right? In the rich young ruler's case, it was the one thing that was keeping him from Christ, from really seeing Christ. It was keeping him from seeing Jesus as the Messiah. Because if he really saw Jesus as the Messiah, and it sounds like he, he did, right? He good teacher, right? Who are you saying is good? Only God is good. But no, no, he wanted Jesus to see him. He wanted Jesus to see, look at my righteousness. Give me that. Tell me I'm good enough to get into heaven. Tell me I've done enough to get there. And if you don't know it, you can never do good enough to get into heaven. I don't care how good you, you could be the next Mother Teresa. It's not good enough because it's got to be through Christ. He's got it. You've got to follow Him. And so there's good things that get in our way. Money, right? Our kids, our family, right? How many times have we, you know, Kimberly and I, we had this conversation quite often because it's so easy to get sucked into the rat race of life and you feel like you're doing right but to what expense kids are busy these days not just with extracurricular activities the school demands a lot more out of them and uh, uh, and demands a lot more out of the parents because we ain't got through the first semester yet and I'm about to tap out they've been laughing at me because they've been doing English I'm like I blame it on my parents that we moved at pivotal points in my Education, but but you can ask Connie. I make her spell check when I have to send out something. She loves correcting my grammar. I mean, Kevin, she really loves correcting my grammar. It's not just trying to be a helpmate at the office. She loves it. She finds joy in correcting it. Uh, but I don't. I, it, it's it's tough. Our kids. They, they and and my job is to lead them to to the cross, to lead them to find Jesus and to follow Jesus, and and to be formed by Him. And so many times we compartmentalize that life that, okay, okay, good, you know. Uh, uh, I was thinking today, like, you know, we're, we're starting to talk about opening Wednesday nights back up or, or if it is Wednesday nights, is it a different night? Like we're having those conversations and I'm thinking, man, where are we, you know, what are we going to do with that schedule when that schedule gets here? And, and we're not even busy compared to, to other families. And we, we have that conversation quite often. And, and guess what? Some of those families are rocking it. They go to those places and they're, they're having conversations, they're bringing life, they're, they're promoting Jesus. And some of them think that they are, you know. Uh, they, it's just this idea that we're doing good, you know. And, and, you know, describing this rich young ruler, it's that youth, that young in there. It's not necessarily he was, he was younger. But, but in, the, in, in our stands, what we can take from that is, is we just have this ambition. We're young, right? I've got, I don't want to sell all my stuff right now. I've, I've got a little more life to live. You know, how many of you have books? I used to. I'm fixing to be 39 in December. And I, I, I know y'all couldn't tell. Uh, I don't know how 
Facebook Live portrays it, but uh, I ask the kids all the time at the We Center, I think the highest I've gotten is 25. And how do you think I am? 25? I was like, good, we'll keep it that way. Shade this beard and I look even younger. So, But we do, there was an age I remember in my life, like things are not what I thought they would be at 38 and 39. I desired to have kids. I, I didn't obviously didn't know I was going to have three. Didn't know one of them was going to be from Ethiopia. Would I change it? No. But but we, we had this deal. Uh, you know, conversations I have with with college age kids. Right. Well, I just got a lot of school right now. I'm going to focus on school. And then when I get this good job, uh, hopefully hopefully if things play my cards right and get into that uh, the right part of the the college, I'm going to find me a wife. You know, I don't want to I don't want to be this. This, this major over here, I want to find this doctor or lawyer wife over here. But we have these things planned up because we got this big plan of what we're going to do with our life. And those plans are not necessarily bad until they take us away from what God wanted us to do. But then they do. Okay, I'm going to graduate college at 22. Hopefully then, you know, in, in the South, we get married a lot younger than people in, the, in, in other states. Like, it's really young to get married in your 20s. Other states, it's the 30s. It starts happening. But whatever. We think we're going to do this thing, and then, you know, but when I have kids, that's when I'm going to get back in church because I know how important it was to my parents. You know, we, ta- we, we buy this deal, and it's kind of the same deal with this. He was rich. He was young. Like, it was just this, we have the world, you know. We know people die, right? We know we don't live forever. We know, but it, we, it just seems so far away. And then you get to be 38 or 39, or maybe even it's a little younger. I can only tell you from my standpoint. But then somebody, some guy has a heart attack at 38. And you're like, whoa. It kind of just breaks you up out of that trance. Whoa. There's something bigger going on here than my job, than, than, than my family, than these sports. I love sports, right? How many of us were freaking out back in April and May when they shut the NCAA tournament down? I, I wasn't necessarily freaking out, but I was frustrated. Like, man, this is going to be interesting. What are we going to do? And then it was. It was very interesting watching them trying to figure that out and and now we have football back, right? And people, man, the world's good because maybe maybe for you, you're a disciple of football. But we do. We do all these things. And here's where we're at today. This, this is how we're going to end it. This is where, where I know, I didn't know how I was going to get there, but this is where we're going to do it. We have all these things. And for me, it's not one thing. Like, Jesus couldn't say, hey, here's this one thing. For me, there's a lot of things. But there is normally that one big thing. And maybe it's a good thing. Maybe not un- unintentionally you allowed your kids to really dictate what you do. Maybe it's your job has started allowing you to dictate. You work everything around that, right? Maybe it's uh, school, you know, because it does demand a lot. It dictates everything that you do. And then you give this part to Jesus, this part to your work. You've got to quit compartmentalizing your life because Jesus has put you in places to impact his kingdom. But there's so many things that separate us, you know, from Christ, from him being really, you know, here in a minute we're going to sing King of, the, King, King of My Heart. And the prayer is that he really is the king of your heart. But I texted the, the worship team that, that I've had to get there because there's so many things in my life that compete for that seat in my heart. Sometimes it's expectations. Like we expect God to do things. And then it doesn't work out like we think and we're, we just get frustrated. And, and, and God's saying, hey, here's your one thing. Get rid of those expectations. Oh, you workaholic? Go get rid of that job. And I may be speaking to somebody. It may not be, hey, I don't want you to go be a bum, but that job has demanded too much. You're not, you need to go find another job. And maybe today is the day you start looking for another job and you just needed that. Maybe it's extracurricular activities with, with your kids. Not that sports are bad or, or, or playing the piano is bad or whatever. But is, who is the king of your heart? It may, it may be sin, if we're going to be really honest, because all of those are probably tied in that, why, why do you have a need to, do, you know, to work all the time? Why? There's that question, why? Why? 
You know, but if we're going to be disciples of Christ, we have to be fully formed. Well, how do we get fully formed by Him? Through the reading of His Word. And, and for so many people here, I've, I've ministered to over the last couple of years, you know, it starts here. This is God's Word. This is His instruction manual. You know, I've shared it before. If Francis Chan, who's one of the guys that I really enjoy, he says the deal, he, he, he's Asian. He said, if the Bible said it's good for Asian people to go stand on their head for 15 minutes a day, we should do it. Maybe you should go stand in, you know, he said, even if it says in public, if he says it's good, we should do it. And that's how we have to approach this, his word. And there's some easy things. There's some promises in here. Honor your father and mother, kids. Why? Anybody know? Long life. You want to live longer? Honor me. Right? I tell that to my, to my son all the time. Right? He said he may die young, Dad. <laughs> but uh, we have to... And guess what? There's some things because we have to be fully formed by this. It's a renewing of our mind by God's Word. And it's not just about reading it. It's applying it. So guess what, church? If it says you've got to forgive people, you've got to forgive people. That's what he says. And maybe that's what your one thing would be. Hey, that's great. This is what I need you to do. That, that person that you're now bitter towards, that, you know, that thing that happens, you don't even know what has happened, but it's been 20 years, and now your families are like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Maybe that's it today. Unforgiveness, bitterness, shame, right? I, I could imagine somebody that, that has a past. Don't we all have a past? Don't we all have a mess that God wants to make a message? But for some, they just carry that shame with them wherever they go. And it's almost like, like an Eeyore moment here. Somebody with shame. Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit? And they're all probably looking down at the ground because they feel like they don't belong, but they do desire eternal life. And so I can almost have seen Jesus like, hey, look at me. Lift your head. You've got to know who you are in me. You've got to let that go. Yeah, that was, that was who you once were, but that's not who you are now. And that's what I see at the church. That's, this is what this place is supposed to be, a place that we come and we get tended to and we get fired up and we get encouraged and then we go out and we bring more people because our life has been affected by being fully formed by Jesus. But I see so many people that come and it's almost like uh, if I could just get some relief, like having that headache, if I could just... If I could just have 10 minutes of no. So you come for that. You, it's, like, it's like an hour, hour and a half of relief. And then when it's time to go, whatever label you brought in, whatever shame, whatever guilt, whatever burden you brought, you kind of just throw it back in your knapsack. And you gotta, you got to leave it. Pride, right? Maybe that's your one thing. They're going to keep coming to me. I told Jesus I wasn't going to go till I'm done. But what is that one thing? that is the king of your heart. And it may be something that's been sitting, seated on that throne in your heart for years. It may be a new season that it's just kind of crept up that you didn't know because it's, it's I am entering the season, my oldest daughter's in the seventh grade, and I watched these kids start athletics in the seventh grade, and now they're seniors. Like I'm in that stage that I got, you know, there's some, there's some great apps, there's some good visual aids of how many days left I have with with with. Bless Emmy, bless Lila's heart. Is she just kind of gets thrown into Emmy's deal because they're so close in age. But with my girls, I don't have that many more days. So what am I trying to instill in them, right? There's some, there's some great things that they can learn, some life lessons that they're going to have to learn, how to, how to be godly when things don't go your way, how to be godly when, uh, uh, you know, a class is hard. And so are you doing your best, you know? It was something that I was taught. Sometimes my best work was a B. Sometimes it was. Probably most times it wasn't, but sometimes it could be. So it's not necessarily making good grades. It's are you doing your best. And why are we doing our best? Because your dad and mom say so or because God calls you to do your best? And we can do those things. And all those things that I mentioned, at your job, are you doing your best because it just gives you money? Are you doing your best because it's what God wants you to do? At sports, or, you know, I tell my girls all the time, hey, are you giving the most effort? And there's days that effort comes really easy. But the hard days, are you giving it your best? What is separating you? What is keeping you from seeing Jesus the way he's supposed to be? Are you just reading his word and not applying it? Because as a church, we're called to look differently. 
I've shared this before, and it still is probably worse today than it was five years ago. But there were these families that were dropping their kids off at college, and they were interviewing them. Man, what do you hope for your kid? Man, I hope he, he, he graduates, he gets a good job, he has a good family. They interviewed like 100 families. And those aren't bad things, right? They asked 50 Christian parents and 50 people that were non-Christians. Same answers. We're not called to be the same. We're called to be different. We're called to be, we're a peculiar kind of people. I hope, and it's a hard prayer sometimes. It's something I pray for my son. My son has a love for God like I've never seen. He loves his stories. I, I, I should have put it on there. I've got a picture because my mom is, is really good of helping uh, encourage him in some things, gets him riled up sometimes. But I sent her a picture the other day, and in our driveway where we're staying at was a big pile of rocks and sticks stacked on it. And this big puddle, he had poured five tractor supply, five gallon buckets of water on there. And I came out and said, What? And you, you just got to know, Silas, what in the world are you doing? And I got a picture of him because it was kind of, I wasn't even, he was calling fire down from heaven because he had just heard about Elijah. And it was, and he loves it. And there's part of me that wants him to be the first Ethiopian football player in the NFL, right? Who, what dad doesn't want that? Or a doctor, or a lawyer. But I need to recognize the gift that he has right now, that he loves. I mean, he's gotten in trouble at school for telling other kids about Jesus. And it's funny, and we laugh about it, but I need to encourage that in him. Miss Kendrick is his teacher. Y'all pray for her. But... She's like, he said, Miss, Miss Silas, you need to do your work. Miss Kendrick, I'm telling these, pe- these kids, some of them don't know about God. She says, I hear that, but God would want you to do your work. God is more important than work, Miss Kendrick, you know. She said, I agree, but he would want you to do your work. Yes, ma'am, you know, he, he got it there. But music team, you can make your way up here. I don't know how long I'm going to close, but I want to make sure that we get there today. So if you had to take a self-evaluation of your heart right now, and Jesus may be seated in the, in the chair, but who's sitting on the armrest? We all have them. We all have things that separate us. There's different seasons. And this is where, really where I feel like God... Because we've got to see Jesus for who he is. We have to that we were created with the purpose. Most of us, because we live in a fallen world, probably are not pursuing that purpose that God has called us to. He called us to life for a purpose. Why is that? Because we got some things maybe seated in that chair. Maybe, Maybe you're here today and if that's you, you've never let Jesus sit in that, that chair. And, and you began to be start following him and you began to be formed by his word and it's not easy and it's hard to look around because quite frankly all of us Christians can do a better job at obeying what he says and living it out we know what he says right but we don't live it out and so if that's you today you never let him do that it's, it's, it's a beautiful that's one of the promises he gets us. follow him give him your heart Confess to him that you are a sinner and the only way you can get to heaven ain't by works like the rich man. I've done all these things. I'm a good person. You're not good. There's only one good and that's God. And you need him. Because one of the saddest things about this story is the rich young ruler couldn't give up his wealth, didn't want to give up his position and authority, But if we can get there, if we can get out of our youthful state of mind and we can think towards the end, guess what happened to him? He got rid of all of it. When he died, he no longer had wealth because you can't take it with you. He no longer had power and prestige. So God, right now, you're alive. You're able to make a decision. You can decide to follow Christ. But for the church here today, I got to believe most of us would claim to be disciples of Christ. But there are things that are competing for for that spot, and there shouldn't be. 
right? He said, those that have given up your, your, your husband, your wife, your children, oh, you'll get a special treasure. Why? Because sometimes those things can become an idol in our life. Those things can separate us from what God has called us to do. And so here's a chance. This is where I wanted to get today. We're fixing to sing King, King of My Heart. And my prayer is that Jesus is the king of your heart and that you can sing that like you've never sung it before today. But if I have to be honest, I'm going to be honest. When I started this week, I don't think Jesus was the king of my heart. There was things that had just occupied my mind, occupied my time, and, oh, but you're a pastor, you've given up a career in banking to come, and I could compare myself to other people but when it came between, when I was standing face to face to Jesus, Jesus, and he didn't do it to get on to me. He did it because he loves me. And he loves you. And he's tired of seeing people just walk through life. And he wants to give you that abundant life. But he can't give you that abundant life where sin and stuff is found. And so the challenge for you, church, is when we sing that, maybe you're not there, but let it be a statement of that you're going to get there this week, that you want him to be the king of your heart. We're going to have this altar open. Maybe it's a time that you come and you, you place whatever that is. And don't just place it in, right here, as Josh said last week. It's a great posture of what you're wanting to do. But put into plan. You know, if it's social media, right in there in your pew, get rid of it. If, if you know that is what it is. If it's unforgiveness, go outside and call that person. Make a, you know, call them on the phone. or If you've got to do it in person, which I think is better, Make a plan to go see them today because we're not promised tomorrow. Maybe it's, a, it, maybe it's that label of shame, regret, whatever that thing is that is keeping you from Christ, from seeing him. Because, you know, the other part of that, if you flip over to Luke chapter 19, it's about a story called Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but what did he want to do? He climbed that tree so he could see let me tell you how much he saw Jesus. He went and got rid of his stuff because he knew that was where it was at. Whatever that is in your life, maybe you've been just distanced from God. You know the saying that he never leaves you. You left him. So find him today. Get back into his good graces and follow after him.